because there won't be enough time for me to cover them. But I just wanted to give you some ideas and to let you know that this book is so filled with solutions. So on this page, I have some, because this chapter that I'm pointing to is about women and health disparities. And that is intense. Because women are a population within the population that are experiencing tremendous, <coughs> that are experiencing tremendous health disparities. So, eliminating racism and discrimination in the United States, specifically as directed toward emerging majority women. Recognizing and understanding cultural norms and the need to modify diet and exercise regimens. Ensuring that women are taken care of before pregnancy, throughout the duration of their lives, not just during pregnancy. And so the list goes on with what can we do instead of just listing problems, what are the solutions? So the United Nations uh, pulled together a working group. And these were individuals who are experts who were supposed to look at the issues related to people of African descent in the United States and come up with recommendations. So I have most of the recommendations in the book, but not all. So I'm going to share two of them with you. One is, there is a profound need to acknowledge that the transatlantic slave trade was a crime against humanity. And among the major sources and manifestations of racism, racial discrimination, xenophobia, and related intolerance, and that Africans and people of African descent were victims of these acts and continue to be victims of their consequences past injustices and crimes against African Americans need to be addressed with repertory justice, they said. Until it is understood and acknowledged, this is me speaking as a commentary to their recommendation, that a grave injustice was committed against people of African descent and Native Americans, <coughs> and that there has not been a level playing field for these groups in terms of health and other aspects of life. In the United States, the prospect of actually closing the health status gap remains slim. Repertory justice is controversial, a matter of serious debate, because to place a monetary figure on such atrocities is essentially impossible. Mm -hmm. However, perhaps the assurance of health care for all who are descendants of slavery regardless of their ability to pay, may be a good point of discussion. <laughs> That's a nice place to start. Yes, indeed. On page 187, one more recommendation. The working group recommends upholding the right to adequate standards of living, including the right to food, the right to water, and the right to adequate housing. They had to write this as a recommendation that people should have a right to these basic things. According to Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I know my students know what that is. <laughs> Biologic and physiological needs must be met. Safety needs must be met. Love and belongingness. Esteem needs. Cognitive needs. Aesthetic needs. And self-actualization needs. These are the basic requirements for human beings to survive. So as I come to the end of my portion of this discussion, I'm going to share with you two case studies. What's a case study? The book is written so that it has pedagogical features, meaning that students can learn from this book in class. But I wrote it for everyone in lay terms so that all can understand what I am saying in the book. It is not just for the classroom. It's for everyone. So a case study is a terminology that I have used, but a case study is a story. These are stories based on truth and reality. So what's in the water is the first one. An African-American woman wakes up in the morning in her Flint, Michigan home in a low-income community. Like most people, the physical imperative of urinating is first, followed by a toilet flush. She sadly realizes that flushing the toilet is all that the water in Flint is good for. She walks over to brush her teeth and has to use bottled water. Now donated to her after her fellow community members who have been poisoned 
based on decisions made by other fellow humans, expressed outrage when city management officials decided to use local water rather than water from Detroit, which had been the case previously. Proper research had not been done to determine if this was a healthy, appropriate choice. After brushing her teeth, and it's time to shower and or bathe, how does she cope? Warm up bottled water and take a sponge bath every day? What about her two young children, her baby, and her elderly grandmother who lives with her? She wonders how she will explain the sudden use of only bottled water to her children. She wonders about the homeless people who are already in a dire situation, often relying on water fountains or public bathrooms to take care of their hygienic and hydration needs. What about her dog? What about the stray animals? They drink water too. Bottled water only? Her pipes are ruined from the chemicals placed in the water, which cause corrosion of the pipes and ensuing lead poisoning. When will the pipes be replaced? They are still, as I am standing here talking to you right now, people are using bottled water in Flint, Michigan. They still have not fixed the pipes. What about the quality of life that water affords all living things? Her questions are endless, and she is stressed. All she can do is weep as she goes to her stove and warms bottled water. This is a reality in the United States of America right now as we stand here. So with each case study, I offer commentary with solutions of what can we do. It's obvious what needs to be done in Flint, Michigan. They need to change the pipes and ensure that the people in Flint and everywhere in America has clean water. The next and last case is called Children Need to See. A six-year-old boy entering the first grade has been diagnosed with a severe vision problem remedied by glasses. He is on Medicaid as secured by his mother on his behalf. He lost his first pair of glasses. He is permitted to get a second pair per Medicaid. Unfortunately, he dropped his second pair in the schoolyard and broke them. Medicaid provides only two pair of glasses. His mother has no money to get us his glasses. He is doing very poorly in school because he cannot see without his glasses. His mother seeks help from many venues, but there is no solution. Her young son is now presenting with behavioral problems in the classroom as he is unable to participate fully in schoolwork with his insufficient eyesight and is just halfway through the school year. Children need to see. And the solution associated with that is to get glasses to children in the United States. And of course, I give more detail with each of these commentaries on how to solve these problems, but I just wanted to give you all an idea of what some of these issues are. So with that being said, I have a guest here with me today. And his name is Mr. Clarence Cryer. And I'm very happy to introduce Mr. Cryer. He has his, his, a family here and so forth. Mr. Cryer was one of my students when I first came to Florida at Florida International University, which is where I first began teaching. Came in, very dapper young man, all ready for class. And he was so on top of things, getting all of his work done. Very well raised, his mother is here. Very well raised young man, I knew it right away. And so, um, I wanna tell you about him and then we're gonna talk a little and then we're gonna take question and answers from the audience. Mr. Cryer earned his graduate degree in public health at Florida International University and is a graduate of the Florida Public Health Leadership Institute. He has completed additional studies in epidemiology and biostatistics at Emory University Rollins School of Public Health. Mr. Cry spent much of his career with the Florida Department of Health. During that time, he worked as a disease intervention specialist, senior health educator, health education supervisor, and beyond. In fact, I hired Mr. Cryer. I was the vice president of behavioral health services at the Jesse Trice Center for Community Health in Liberty City for a while. 
and I called upon him to come and serve as one of my directors, and he did an excellent job. So when I was writing this book, who did I call upon again? <laughs> Mr. Cryer, to write one of my chapters. So he's actually a contributing author to this book. And Mr. Cryer's chapter is about children. So my discussion of children need to see is in regard to um, my lead into Mr. Cryer's discussion of all that he found in relationship to children. So he now um, lives in California. He was born in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, but was raised here in Miami. So he knows all about the diversity of issues and so forth here in Miami. So we're going to sit down and just have a quick chat about some of the things that he found in his chapter. Um, and then we'd like to take questions from you all if you have any or would like to discuss with us. So, Mr. Cryer, if you can join me up here for a little bit. Um, maybe you need the microphone, I don't, because I, I carry. Um, if we have people waiting in the rooms that need to be seated, there are a few seats still left. We can give people a chance to get seated comfortably. Yes, please. What? Okay. So, I want to uh, begin by asking you, Mr. Cryer. And I'm going to refer to him as Clarence, if you, if you mind. Okay, great. <laughs> what are two key problems that you identify in terms of children and health disparities? I'm going to kind of double up this question. And the second is, did you find any area where children of color are at the same level in terms of health status as their white counts? Well, I looked um, at several disparities, but I focus <laughs> primarily on four in that in this particular chapter. And the first issue that I focused on was infant mortality. And why I focused on infant mortality is because it's a barometer. It's a basis of comparison for health systems internationally. How we treat and care for our youth and our young people and our elderly is a sign of the level of importance for how a nation prioritizes the care of its, of its individuals. So I looked at infant mortality and some of what I found, I mean I knew intuitively that there were certain things and that the data that I looked at confirmed those issues. Uh, one of them is that we have made tremendous progress in regards to infant mortality, reducing infant mortality in the United States. However, when you look at the rate of reductions of infant mortality in this country, white children are far superior in terms of the rate that infant mortality has been reduced. So much so that over the last 30 or 40 years, the gap in infant mortality has widened, meaning that um, where it may have started out similarly initially, but as the years progress, the gap between white infants dying and black infants dying and other infants of color dying got wider and wider. So moving in the wrong direction. Um, so um, I looked at that. And then secondarily, I looked at oral health. Because oral health is um, a lot of times manifestations of what's going on in the body uh, is first presented in the mouth. And so if there are individuals, children, specifically for this chapter, who do not have oral care, then that's a missed opportunity for a dentist to be able to look into the mouth of the children and see what other issues may possibly be going on. And so added to that was the fact that children of color have more oral health diseases than children, than, than their white counterparts. And so you asked for two, but I, was, <laughs> I have one more. Okay. Uh, I also looked at obesity because I wanted to look at issues where the divide was not just black and white, literally and figuratively. And so I found that with obesity, um, white children are far superior in terms of obesity than they are to um, Hispanic and Native American children. Hispanic and Native American children suffer obesity at far greater rates than white children. So it's not specifically a black and white issue, but all children of color across all health um, issues are 
uh, fare unfavorably in comparison to white children. So that's what that's what the data shows, and that's what I know intuitively. And I think most of us know that intuitively. Okay. So we're focusing on solutions. That is our goal. There's a new hashtag that I have created called Let's Talk About Solutions. So we will continue to share information about solutions through this hashtag and other venues. 